Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Be seated, please. Case number 23-5142. Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals, Inc., the balance versus Xavier Becerra in his official capacity as Secretary of Health and Human Services at all. Ms. Stetson for the appellant, Ms. Mittal for the Federal Appellees, Mr. Burgess for the Appellee Invagen Pharmaceuticals, Inc. Morning, Ms. Stetson. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. My name is Kate Stetson. I represent the appellant, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. Ipsen's product, Somatuline Depot, is a biological product. The active ingredient in Somatuline Depot and reotide acetate assembles into long, complex chains and structures. Those chains and structures are proteins, as FDA defines them, which means somatuline depot is a biological product. The district court concluded that FDA's definition of protein, however, unambiguously requires FDA to look not at the active ingredient as it exists in Ipsen's product, but at lanreotide acetate, just the eight you know, peptide amino acid chain by itself before the product is even created. But FDA doesn't regulate amino acid chains. It regulates drug products and biological products. And both the statute and the regulation refer to biological products. The product is what's labeled. The product is what's marketed. And the product is what's used, as it was here, by a competitor as a reference product. The active I guess I'm not following why, where, where this is going with product or timing. I and mean, whether we look at whatever time we look at, the active ingredient is, I'm not sure I'll pronounce it right, but lanreotide acetate, right? The active ingredient is lanreotide acetate. I think the question, Judge Katsis, is I think everyone agrees and concedes that lanreotide acetate, when it is in Ibsen's product, assembles into these complex structures. So it's not a question, as we say in our brief, that often occurs when you're talking about the difference between an active ingredient and an active moiety, all of the things that often come up. This is the question about what does the active ingredient, lanreotide acetate, look like in the finished drug product? Not what does lanreotide acetate look like off by its own, on the shelf, before its manufacture. What you're looking at when you're asking the question about what is a biological product is what is the thing that is in this product? And the, th Sorry, but the question about what is in the product seems like a different question from what the active ingredient is. It seems that both Ipsen and the FDA agree that we have to look at the active ingredient in the product. And normally we think of active ingredient as the thing that has the pharmacological effect on the body. And isn't that the lanreotide acetate itself, not the nanotubes? I mean, I don't see Ipsen anywhere make the argument that it's the nanotubes that have the pharmacological effect. No, Judge Rao, I don't think we're arguing that the nanotubes themselves, you know, at least solely convey the pharmacological effect. I think they play an important role in how this drug is delivered. But I think FDA's focus on active ingredient and the definition of active ingredient and what it means to have pharmacological effect, of course, are getting one and two and three steps away from what the statute and the definition actually say. And when we're looking at the statute, when it talks about what is a biological product, a biological product is a protein. What is a protein? You look at the definition. A protein is a collection of amino acids with a specific defined sequence, more than 40 in length, and so on and so forth. You know, the, the question about the active ingredient, I think, doesn't appear anywhere in the statute. So what FDA is doing is trying to draw your attention away from the word product and towards this entire other inquiry that isn't based in the text in front of you. I'm, I'm a little confused about why you're, you and your brief don't um, say anything about the second sentence in the definition of active ingredient in the regulation that's at um, 21 CFR 314.3. Um, so the first sentence 
um, reads active ingredient as any component that is intended to furnish pharmacological activity or direct effect in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease or to affect the structure or any function of the body of man or other animals. So that's the first sentence. And then the second sentence says, the term includes those components that may undergo chemical change in the manufacture of the drug product and be present in the drug product in a modified form intended to furnish the specified activity or effect. I mean, that sounds like your argument, but that's that language isn't in your brief other than citing to it in the statutory and regulatory addendum. Right. So, Judge Wilkins, I, I do agree with your reading of that second sentence. I think it's more useful for our argument than for Invigens or the government's. I think one reason why we weren't focusing on the definition of the active ingredient is because the, the definition of the active ingredient, as I was saying to Judge Rao, you know, all, already begins to pull you away from the definition that matters here. But to the extent that you look at that definition and the definition expands in such a way as to include the active ingredient as it exists in that finished product that's intended to confer, you know, not just the activity, but the function, I think that's an important part of the, of the overall analysis. The other thing that I would add that's, I think, in a similar vein is if you look at the definition of biological product in the statute, which is 42 U.S.C. 262-I-1, the term biological product includes a number of things, serums, venoms, toxins, uh, including proteins applicable to the prevention, treatment, or cure of a disease or condition of human beings. And I think to the extent, Judge Wilkins, that runs in parallel with the definition of active ingredient, then I think the two can be read somewhat consonantly in that way. But the intervener and FDA point out that if we were to adopt your position about what is a biological product, then one formulation of this octopeptide would not be a biological product, it'd be a drug product, while the Somatulin Depot formulation would be a biological product because the drug is also administered instead of this extended release version, but, but as a, um, I guess, immediate release version where you don't have the nanotubes. And um, so what say you to that problem? I think that is a feature of the way that FDA has decided to regulate. So if you read FDA's uh, memorandum that supports its definition of protein, all of the different options they considered, if you read its proposed rule and its final rule, one of the things that FDA says repeatedly is, we, we understand that by creating these bright line rules, we're going to be walling things in and walling things out. And that there are things on either side of those walls that someone else could argue you know, arguably are proteins. So just because there is a different formulation of an active ingredient in a product that doesn't have, that doesn't satisfy that definition of protein, that's, I think, a feature of the definition. And to the extent that that becomes an actual problem rather than some theoretical problem, I think Congress and FDA have the ability to change the definition as it currently exists. What exists right now is a product that contains a protein. And the protein, of course, is a biological product. So but you, you, your client, Ipsen, also markets and sells this in a formulation that's not the Somatulin Depot, the extended release, with the same octopeptide, right? I believe that's correct. I don't know the extent to which, you know, how much is sold or, or so forth. And I don't the even know. The big seller, that. obviously, is the... Somatulin Depot product. Correct. Yep. But the point remains that you would have one formulation be a biological product and one wouldn't if you were to prevail. I think that's correct. But I, I think, as I mentioned, the, the, the answer... do the same thing. 
They do not do the same thing. And, and to the extent that we start looking at the question of what they do, I think we're, again, not looking at the definition. One of the things that FDA said in its memorandum and in its proposed and final rule is we're actually not going to look at function. We are going to create, to the extent we can, a bright line rule so that we don't have to have extended debates about what falls in and outside that rule. So if we were looking at function, maybe then we could have a debate about whether the thing that uh, extended release Sumatroline Depot does is different than the other form of lane reatide acetate. But by creating this definition as it did, intentionally to create these kind of concrete rules of application, FDA was necessarily making some judgments about how to go about assessing things. And one of the things that Even FDA... with the bright line, though, don't we still have to look at what the active ingredient is in the drug? Yes, you have to look at what the active ingredient is in the drug. That, that's exactly right. You don't look at the active ingredient as it exists in some kind of theoretical octopeptide form. You look at the what it is doing in the product. And what it's doing in this product, I think everyone would agree, is assembling into these complex nanotube structures. So, but how do the nanotubes meet the definition of active ingredient in the regulation? I know you say that's moving away from the statute itself, but, but I think in your briefing, you can see that it has to be the active ingredient. You said just now it has to be the active ingredient. So how do the nanotubes meet this definition? Well, I, I think the nanotubes meet the definition, the, the, what meets the definition of active ingredient is the lanreotide acetate, the active ingredient in the drug product, which is where your question started also, Judge Rao, is lanreotide acetate nanotubes. And I think, you know, keying off of Judge Wilkins's earlier point about that second sentence in the uh, active ingredient definition, to the extent we need to smooth over what active ingredient means alongside what the definition of protein and the definition of biological product means, that's probably the hook to do it. But the important thing for asking this question, which is, is this a biological product, is that you're not asking, is lanreotide acetate a biological product? You're asking, is somatoline depot a biological product? And I think the question is, what is this product and what does it consist of? It consists of an active ingredient that has formed, self-assembled into nanotubes. Now, one of the things that FDA says, of course, is even if you take the active ingredient as it exists in the product, it still doesn't meet the definition of protein because according to FDA, the way that these uh, nanotubes assemble doesn't typically occur in nature. Uh, let's stick with that sure. Of ingredient sure. for a while because that's where I am as well. Okay. Um, is it fair to say, my, my understanding, my limited understanding of the chemistry here is that the, the active ingredient is just being dissolved in acidic water, correct? It's being dissolved in water at room temperature, yes. So, I mean, there's no, the, the relevant chemical or molecule is still lamreotide acetate. And whatever's happening in water, I don't know, maybe it, maybe the chemicals are aligning and it's aligning in a certain way because of the electric charge of water or whatever. I don't know what, I don't know what's going on there, but it's still the same molecule, just as we would say water is H2O. H2O is H2O even when it assembles in these huge ice crystals. Mm -hmm. I think the difference... Two points, Judge Katsas. The first is the, the definition of protein, I think, by, you know, even in itself, contemplates that you're going to be looking at this question at some particular point in time. Because remember, that second part of the definition, the one we're not talking about yet, talks about assembling uh, in a manner that occurs in nature. So you're already making an assumption about when these proteins assemble together. And to your sort of first part of your question, the, the definition of protein, the definition of biological product, the definition of active ingredient, none of those things asks the question, what is this molecule? And does this molecule standing alone do something? Even going back to the definition of biological product that should ground the discussion, the definition of biological product is, among other things, a protein or analogous product, which we should talk about, applicable to the prevention, cure, or treatment of disease in human beings. You know, the molecule of lanreotide acetate, you don't apply to a prevention, treatment, or, or cure. You apply somatoline depot. You apply insulin. Insulin itself is, consists of two peptides that don't themselves 
qualify as a protein, but insulin is a protein. If you were to take insulin apart and look at those two separate molecules, they wouldn't qualify as a protein. But when you put them together, insulin becomes a protein. I think it's exactly the same analysis here. It's a fair, I, that has some force to it, but it just sounds like you're trying to unravel what I thought was a fairly clear acknowledgement in your briefs that what, what we're talking about is the active ingredient. I, I embrace that idea. I think the question is what, what we're talking about is the active ingredient in the drug product. The active ingredient sort of off on its own, just the octopeptide, is not what the statute or the regulation tell you to look at. You know, the, the regulation itself wouldn't have to say you can count these separate structures towards the 40 amino acid count if you're just looking at those structures as they exist before anything happens to them, before the product is created, before somatoline depot is manufactured. And I know my, my time is up. Ms. Jackson, I if, I can, if I can just maybe take a step back. So in terms of when we talk about a drug product, we're talking about the active ingredient plus the sort of the substance or the form it takes and how it's administered. And and you're suggesting, I mean, should we understand biological product in the same way, right? It's an active ingredient plus the form in which it's administered. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like the nanotubes are the, the form in which it's administered. It's what make up the product as it's used by a patient. Mm -hmm. But um, but that doesn't mean that, that is the, the nanotubes are the active ingredient. So it seems to me the protein is more analogous to the drug substance or the the active ingredient. And you seem to be saying the biological product is just, you know, the, you know, the somatical whole, depot the whole as it's, as it's yeah. administered. Yeah. And so that seems like it would separate the definition of what a biological product is from what we think of as a drug product. And it seems the more natural reading is to think of those two things in a similar way. I do agree that we should think of those two things in a similar way. So one of the arguments that I hear FDA and uh, Invigen making in their briefs is that it's wrong to look at the definition of drug product because there's no you know, similar definition of biological product. The definition of drug product under the regulations is the product in its finished dosage form. Um, keying off of your question, I think then it makes only logical sense for a biological product also to be the finished dosage form. That's why finished everything dosage form, but the yeah. active ingredient is 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 not the finished dosage form. It's it's the thing that actually has the pharmacological effect in the, the finished active, dosage. Exactly, form. the active ingredient in the finished dosage form. I think that's that's the difference. What what FDA and Invagen are trying to do is to just strip out this idea of the active ingredient separate it completely from the rest of the product and just look at this molecule by itself and ask the question, what does this molecule do and how long is it? But we already know that FDA already has defined something to be an addition of molecules in certain circumstances. We know that this definition that we're looking at asks the question about what is a biological product. We know that the active ingredient that matters is the active ingredient as it exists in the product because, to your earlier point, Judge Rao, that's what's doing the work. What's doing the work in the finished product is the active ingredient as it exists in that finished product. Well, what is doing the work? The nanotubes aren't doing the work. The lanreotide acetate is doing the work. So I, I, right? think so I don't see you to making an argument that the nanotubes themselves <clears throat> are doing the work. The nanotubes are just a way to slowly administer the lanreotide acetate, right? When I say doing the work, I think I'm using it as a, a rather a shorthand. I think what you, will, what you will, it's not the pharmacological effect. It's not, and there's a reason I'm not saying pharmacological effect, because that gets us several steps removed from the definitions that we're actually concerned about. What's doing, when I say doing the work, it means applicable to the prevention uh, of illness, disease, or, or uh, prevention or cure of illness, disease, under the definition of biological product. The thing that is doing the work is the product itself, including the active ingredient as it exists in the product, not just some random octopeptide. That's not what's being regulated. It's not what's being used as the reference product. The reference product is somatoline depot. So you um, don't think FDA could reasonably distinguish between 
doing doing the work in the stricter sense that Judge Rao might have been getting at pharmacological effect, you know, affecting the structure and function of the body of man or whatever it is within the human body mm -hmm. on the one hand, and doing the work in the sense of a, a dosage release mechanism. I think again, the, maybe the way to marry up those two things is to look at that second definition sentence that Judge Wilkins pointed out. To the extent that we're going to talk about uh, a biological product as the containing... The second sentence presupposes a chemical change. It just goes back to the lamreotide acetate. The second case. sentence presupposes a chemical or structural change. And what we're talking about here is the structure of lamreotide acetate as it exists in the finished dosage product. The term, of some term in, includes components that may undergo chemical change in the manufacture of the drug product. When we talk about a chemical change, the chemical uh, change that occurs is the, and, and let me actually take one step back because I think the more that we talk about chemical changes and I mean, molecules and so forth. Molecule dissolving in water at room temperature. Maybe I'm misremembering my chemistry. I don't think that's a chemical change. It's the same Mo molecule. Molecules associating water. lengths of amino acids associating with each other, forming complex structures, I think easily qualify as a chemical change. But, but again, e even reading you know, this definition of this word that doesn't appear in either the statute or regulation that we're talking about gets you further and further away from the text. What the text says is, ask the question, is this a biological product or an analogous product applicable to the prevention or cure of a disease or illness? If this is a protein, it, it is a biological product. And you don't just ask the question, is this octopeptide floating around in the wild a biological product, you ask the question whether somatulene depot is a biological product. I think all of the work that... But you also agree that it's the active ingredient in the somatulene depot. I do. That is the protein. I do. But I you think haven't you're... explained how the nanotube is the active ingredient. When we ask you that question, you say, well, active ingredient is too far from the statutory definition. Judge Rao, I, I think maybe the difference that you and I are having is, is just where the emphasis is being put. You're emphasizing active ingredient in the drug product. I'm emphasizing active ingredient in the drug product. The active ingredient, lamreotide acetate, forms nanotubes. The nanotubes are part of the lamreotide acetate structure. So I'm not looking at the nanotubes as some separate entity. They are nanotubes of lamreotide acetate. That's the active ingredient in the finished drug product. I think that's how to tie the two together. If, if I could take a couple minutes and just touch on the two other issues that I think are, are particularly important here. One of them is this question about occurring, uh, associating in a manner that occurs in nature. This is a uh, quintessential rewriting of an agency regulation. What the agency regulation says is when two or more chains associate with each other or are associated with each other in a manner that occurs in nature, you count them together for purposes of counting the size of that polymer. And what FDA said below and what it says again in its briefs is these amino acid chains, these nanotubes of lamreotide acetate are not associated with each other in a manner that typically occurs in nature. We agree that this happens in nature. It just doesn't typically happen. But that is just flat out redlining of the regulation. So that's, I think, my, my short uh, argument on the second point. The third point is, even if you uh, take FDA at its word that the thing that you look at is lamreotide acetate in the wild, even if you agree that these don't typically occur in nature, you're left with this question about whether this is an analogous product. And what uh, FDA has argued before, and this is a Teva case, is that the critical element of a protein, the touchstone, uh, and that's at the Teva case, pin site 113 and 115. The critical element of a protein is a specific defined sequence of amino acids. And of course, we have a specific defined sequence of amino acids. But now, of course, what FDA is saying, what, oh, there's actually one more critical touchstone, and that is it absolutely has to be more than 40 amino acids long, and it has to be typically occurring in nature. But with those touchstones, anything else can be a protein. 
once you establish that the thing that is analogous to a protein has to actually be a protein, you're no longer reading anything into the words analogous product. So I think even if you disagree with us on our first two points, the FDA's reading of analogous product is simply not consonant with the way that that regulation must be read in order to have any substance to it. What about their example of the mixture? I think under the... the proteins and other non-amino acid molecules dissolve together. They both have pharmacolog pharmacological effect. It's a mixture containing proteins, which provides a vehicle for treating the non-amino acid component as a protein, as well as the protein component. I think under FDA's definition of protein, a mixture containing a protein is a protein. And I think that's the problem with FDA's sole example of the thing that it considers to be analogous to a protein is a thing containing a protein. That just doesn't work. If there are no further questions. All right. Thank you. Thank we'll you, Ross. some time on rebuttal. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Ms. Mittal. Good morning. May it please the court, Urja Mittal for the government. As you just heard, Ibsen agrees that the active ingredient is the proper frame of analysis for deciding whether its product is a protein. And Ibsen also agrees that the active ingredient and its product is made up of eight amino acids. That's enough to decide this case and conclude that Ibsen's product is not a protein. The active ingredient in Ibsen's product is made up of one eight amino acid chain. It's that eight amino acid chain that has the specific therapeutic effect that Ibsen identifies on its product labeling. It's that eight amino acid chain that binds to the somatostatin receptors in the body and mimics the function of natural somatostatin in the body. It is not the nanotubes that have that pharmacological effect. And those nanotubes are not the active ingredient as Ibsen recognizes. The associations between the amino acid chains and the nanotubes are associations between copies of the active ingredient. And again, Ibsen has told you the active ingredient is the proper frame of analysis for deciding whether a product is a protein. Can I uh, interrupt you for a sec? The regulatory definition of active ingredient says that it's any component that is intended to furnish pharmacological activity or other direct effect. So the regulation itself doesn't restrict active ingredient to um, furnishing pharmacological effect. It says other direct effect. So why can't direct effect be putting the ingredient in a formulation that gives it an extended release so that it can um, operate um, over time and person not have to get an injection, you know, every day? Your Honor, there may be products that have active ingredients that are defined that way, but the product before the court today, Somatulin Depot, the active ingredient there is Landry Tide Acetate. And Ipsen told FDA that in its new drug application, it told FDA that in its product labeling, you look at JA305, JA309, on, on those, on, in that product labeling, Ipsen says the active ingredient is Landry Tide Acetate. It's a synthetic octopeptide. There's no mention. Is, is there authority that says that they're bound by that? I mean, my understanding of this is that that was in the context of getting a new drug of application approved. It goes in the orange book, right? That's right. And this is a whole different process for biological um, product that goes in the purple book. It's a whole different kind of regulatory scheme. So what authority, what statute or regulation or case says that, like, once you say in the context of trying to get approval under one provision, you are bound by kind of that description. It's not, right? a, I, it's not a question of an authority binding Ibsen. It's a question of, as you said, Your Honor, defining what the active ingredient is and figuring out what role the nanotubes have to play in this analysis. And FDA explained that in its view, in its scientific judgment, the nanotubes are better considered to be the formulation property or the dosage form. So if you look at 314.3 and, and subsection B, there's also a definition of dosage form. And again, Ibsen identifies this as part of the dosage form, hence the emphasis on finished dosage product, finished, finished, finished dosage form, excuse me, 
And one of the elements of what a dosage form is, is a design feature that affects frequency of dosing. And that is what FDA characterizes and understands the nanotubes to be. They are a self-assembly of lanreotide acetate molecules that affect the frequency of dosing. They're no different from sort of a tablet capsular solution. They're a different form, but they're nonetheless a formulation property. And Ipsen, in its reply brief, doesn't contest that. So it seems to be settled ground that the nanotubes are better understood to be the dosage form of the product, not the active ingredient. So we look- So explain to me what the second sentence of the active ingredient um, regulation, what that means. So the active ingredient, the second sentence, Your Honor, as Judge Katsas says, first there's the question of whether the lanreotide acetate uh, molecule, when it self-assembles into a nanotube, can properly be understood to be undergoing a chemical change. That's something FDA hasn't taken a position on, nor has Ipsen argued that that's considered a chemical change. But an easier way to resolve the application of the second sentence of the definition of active ingredient here is the part that says it's in, in a modified form intended to furnish the specified activity or effect. Nowhere have, has Ipsen said, nor has the FDA concluded, that the nanotube is a form intended to furnish the specified activity or effect. The specified activity throughout the new drug application, throughout the product labeling, throughout the briefing in district court, throughout the briefing in this court, is for the lanreotide acetate octopeptide to bind to the somatostatin receptors in the human cells. That's what affects the human production of human growth hormone. That's the intended pharmacological effect of lanreotide acetate. And at JA, I believe it's 480, FDA explains that it's not the nanotubes that have that biological effect. As, as, as Your Honor said earlier, the nanotubes affect the frequency of dosing, the pharmacological effect that Ipsen sought approval for was binding to those somatostatin receptors. And so even if we can look at the nanotubes as a modified form of lanreotide acetate under the second sentence, which again, FDA hasn't taken a position on, they wouldn't be intended to furnish the specified activity or effect because that effect is the binding. And the binding occurs at that eight amino acid level um, at that octopeptide level. It's not a hypothetical form because that 8-amino acid octopeptide is what separates from the nanotube and then binds to the receptors. It's not the nanotubes that do that. What does um, analogous product mean? So FDA has explained that for purposes of this case, all that this court has to think about is that it doesn't include those products that are specifically excluded from the definition of protein. And so a product with the definition of protein set forth in FDA regulation is um, an amino alpha amino acid polymer with a specific defined sequence that is greater than 40 amino acids in size. This falls outside of that definition expressly and therefore isn't analogous. analogous I don't think I've ever understood anyone to ever contend that in order for something to be analogous, it has to have all of the properties of the thing that you're contending that it's analogous to. That just doesn't make sense. That's right, Your Honor. So the naturally derived mixtures are a good example of this. And contrary to sort of what Ibsen was describing, naturally derived mixture of the kind described in FDA's decision to Ibsen, um, which contains a protein component as well as a non-biological product component, that kind of a product is not a protein. It doesn't fit within the definition of a protein because it has this significant non-biological product component. And a protein is only present in that product in a smaller unknown quantity. But, but why does something not become a protein only because it's not 100% protein? Well, that might not be the only context in which something might not be a protein. And FDA decides whether something is analogous on a case-by-case -case basis. So to but, go back but, to- But here's what I don't understand. If um, if um, if you have, let's say, alcohol that's dissolved in water, and maybe or or other liquid, and whether it's your beer, wine, or vodka, or whatever, you don't say that that mixture doesn't have alcohol because it's in a low concentrate or because it's mixed with one thing rather than another thing, it's still got alcohol in it. 
So I'm not sure how how um, the mixture example really does anything to move the needle as far as giving analogous any meaning. So I think our intuition, FDA's intuition aligns exactly with yours, Your Honor. In the alcohol context, there is alcohol in that mixture that you described, if I understood your hypothetical correctly. And in the naturally derived mixture of the kind FDA described in its decision, there is a protein component. And that protein component meets the definition of a protein in the regulation defining a protein at 21 CFR 600.3. It is an alpha amino acid polymer with a specific defined sequence, but the overall mixture is not a protein. And the active ingredient in that kind of mixture is the whole thing. It's the whole, it's the whole mixture. But FDA says, nevertheless, that's analogous. And I think going back to your honor's original question of how do we think about what are the bounds of an analogous product or when do we, when does that analysis apply? One way of thinking about the naturally derived mixtures is to say, well, those are mixtures. Those are, that's a kind of product that's not addressed by the definition of a regulation. That category is there for FDA to think about products that aren't addressed by the regulation. The regulation talks about alpha amino acid polymers with a specific defined sequence. It doesn't go, begin to help the FDA understand how to think about a naturally derived mixture. And so the mixture example uh, gets, gets analyzed under the naturally derived the analogous product provision of the statute instead. And so it's not a protein, but then deemed analogous to a protein. It's not specifically excluded from the definition of a protein the way an eight amino acid chain like Ipsen's product is. FDA drew a numerical bright line threshold, and this falls outside that threshold. I see my time has expired. In your mixture example, um, is it a mixture because both the protein and the other item that it's mixed with have pharmacological effects? So the that way, yes, Your Honor, the way the FDA thinks, uh, describes the kind of mixture that would be analogous to a protein is that it has a protein component, a non-biological product component, and then the protein component must be necessary for the functioning of the product, and it has to specifically contribute to the product's intended therapeutic effects. So the protein there isn't, isn't meaningless, it's not useless, it's just not the only element of the product. But, oh, go ahead. Oh, I mean, maybe just to follow up on Judge Wilkins' point, I mean, isn't that just saying that something that is part of protein is a protein? So, I mean, that the analogous isn't doing any work? I mean, if it's just a protein and, it, you know, it's a mixture that includes a protein? It's not quite the same, Your Honor, because it doesn't meet the definition of a protein. It's, it's so it, it is classified as a product that's analogous to a protein. It's nonetheless regulated as a biologic but it is not, it's not quite the same because it has that significant other component. So the analogous product category captures that in FDA's view. And there exist, I mean, FDA has classified three products or transitioned three products to regulate, being regulated as a biologic. It's not an empty set, uh, these naturally derived mixtures, nor is the analogous product set an empty set for that, for that very reason. But it doesn't quite fit in the definition of protein. The fact that it sounds analogous to a protein is exactly why it fits within the definition of an analogous product. That's sort of the very nature of that, that it feels so similar to a protein, but it's not specifically excluded by the definition of a protein. And that's why that kind of a mixture, while it's not a perfect comparison to Ipsen's product here, is classified as analogous, whereas Ipsen's isn't. Ipsen's is an eight amino acid chain, and that's far from the 40 amino acid line that FDA drew in its regulation. Before the, that's before the court and not challenged here. A sort of counterintuitive notion of analogous. And I hear analogous to a protein, I think a, a molecule, a chemical, an active ingredient that is almost a protein, but not quite. And the only example you've come up with is something where you, you have one, one active ingredient that is a protein, another one that is nothing close to a protein, and the analogous um, provision is just giving you a hook for treating the wholly non-protein ingredient as a protein. I mean, it hangs together. It's just an odd usage of analogous. So two points, Your Honor. On the naturally derived mixture, the way 
FDA looks at those products, and, and there exists, like as I said, certain products. The whole the whole mixture is the active ingredient. Right. You wouldn't quite say the protein component alone is an active ingredient. So it's the protein and, for instance, a lipid component. And in that, in the case of the actual products before the FDA, there's also a peptide component that's fewer oh, than so 40. Because the protein itself in the hypo can't affect the s- s- bodily structure? Because the protein component alone wouldn't achieve the entire intended I, I, therapeutic effect. I got it. Okay. And so on, on your honor's first point about sort of how we understand the definition of the term analogous, of course, FDA hasn't promulgated a definition. It's left that category uh, somewhat undefined for purposes of regulating products that haven't yet come before the agency and for for allowing for scientific advancement. But it, FDA doesn't understand that to mean products that are quite close to being a protein, but not quite. I mean, that would, that, that, that would defeat the purpose of that bright line rule that FDA drew, and it would allow the term analogous product in the statute to wipe out or render meaningless the term protein, because everything that doesn't fit within the definition of protein could then be regulated as analogous. But FDA drew a clear line in a regulation that's not challenged here, that complex products that are greater than 40 amino acids in chain in length and that meet the other properties of being a protein are going to be what what count as proteins and there there was good reason for that one of the there, there isn't a single characteristic that unites all of the categories of biological products in the statute at 42 USC 262 but one of the common features of biologic products is that they're all fairly complex and FDA in deciding how to define a protein in the unchallenged regulation here said, well, look, we, we've had peptides that are fewer than 40 amino acids in length. They're, they're not quite complex. We have to draw a line for regulatory certainty. And we've regulated peptides as drugs so far. We've approved generic drug applications for peptides for their abbreviated NDAs for those. Um, but, but, but proteins are complex and of a nature sort of... What, what you're doing makes a good bit of sense. I just wonder if it's consistent with statutory scheme, which says one one category of thing is protein, and then the regulatory treatment extends to a broader category of thing, which is anything analogous to a protein. And your reasoning comes back to where Judge Wilkins started us, which is there's a very somewhat complex and very precise definition of protein. And the agency's reasoning is whatever falls outside those lines, not only can't it, not only is it not a protein, it's not, it can't be analogous to a protein because otherwise you're undoing the deliberately precise line that FDA drew and Putting aside mixture, just as a matter of abstract reasoning, that seems to write analogous out of the statute. So, Your Honor, we would disagree that it's writing analogous out of the statute because there are, you can think of them as, as two separate categories. There are things, there, or maybe three, there are products that are proteins and they meet the definition of proteins. They don't have other components. There are products that are specifically excluded by that carefully drawn regulation that the carefully drawn regulation specifically says cannot be proteins. And then there are products that aren't captured by that regulation where the regulation doesn't tell us what to do with that kind of a product. And so the mixture is fall in that third category. Analogous product has, at least as to a protein, has been understood to include why, those kinds of mixtures. On the mixture, why, why is the definition silent as opposed to specifically excluded? Because you have these non-amino acid molecules that are essential to the pharmacological effect. You told me earlier that we have to think of that, the, the non-amino acid component as part of the active ingredient, and that would seem to make, make it not a protein. So the, the way FDA thinks about it is that it's not addressed because it contains an alpha amino acid polymer that otherwise meets the requirements, but does also contains this other other product. So sort of as it, from a practical perspective, that's not quite the same as failing to meet the defining characteristic of a protein as set forth in the regulation. That, that seems to be more specifically excluded. You could, Your Honor, say that 
the mixtures are also excluded in some sense. There's some difference between the nature and, and extent to which it's excluded. Okay, thank you. Has um, it approved anything as a mixture or anything as analogous to a protein? Yes. So there, as I mentioned, Your Honor, there are three products. There are that FDA has evaluated and considered to fall within the definition of a naturally derived mixture with a protein component and a non-biological component. One of them is a product called Infosurf. It's uh, the active ingredient there is calfactant. It's a product for respiratory distress in newborns. And in that product, there's a, there's a protein called surfactant B. It's a surfactant protein. And that protein is an alpha amino acid polymer with a specific defined sequence that's 79 amino acids. That product also has a peptide, so something that's fewer than 40, and then it has a, a non-biological component. And that all of those components work together. They're all part of the active ingredient. Any of them alone couldn't have the specific therapeutic effect, but the protein component is necessary to the product's functioning and specifically contributes to that therapeutic effect. Can I just clarify something on what you were saying about dosage um, form? So um, in either the, the new drug application um, process, orange book process, or this biological product process, the purple book process, um, is it the FDA will might approve one dosage form, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it, it approves all dosage forms of that active ingredient, right? That's right, Your Honor. So the FDA might approve extended release capsules, but not chewable tablets. Or, you know, that doesn't mean that if, if a company has an approval to market extended release capsules containing the active ingredient, that company would be violating the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act if they, without getting separate FDA approval, just started marketing chewable tablets with that active ingredient, right? That's right. So in that sense, the FDA looks at the finished product as the drug product because, you know, approval for one doesn't mean that it's going to be safe in another format, right? For approval purposes, it looks at formula. FDA looks at formulations and dosage forms. It looks at a host of factors. It looks at manufacturing. It looks at the purity or safety or effectiveness, depending on the e kind of product. Exactly. And so when we're talking about biological products, doesn't it work the same? I mean, if if the somatulene product that's ingested and the person has to get the daily ingestion, you know, by a doctor or at a hospital, and that gets approved, that doesn't mean that Ipsen can then just um, come up with this extended release um, formulation and start marketing that without getting a separate approval, right? That's right, Your Honor. For approval, the, the formulation property matters, but for classification, that's not something that FDA, FDA has ever classified or a drug or a biologic based on formulation property or the concentration. This is at I think JA 474. FDA uh, doesn't look at dosage form there. And there's another product that's described in the FDA decision letter to Ipsen named octreotide acetate. It's an octopeptide. It also mimics the function of somatostatin. That's approved in it for immediate and extended release. Both are approved as drugs. And, and for good reason. You, you, if you take a sort of more accessible example, you know, it's not a protein, but if you look, think about ibuprofen, sort of everyday drug, it's regulated as ibuprofen. It's classified as a drug, whether it's an immediate release or extended release form. And so, too, when we're thinking about classifying a product like Symmachulin Depot, for approval purposes, FDA looks at a host of factors, but those aren't all the same factors that FDA looks at for classification. For classification... So, classi so, so help me understand, then, what does... Uh, 262J mean? Because the language in 262J says 
that the food, drug, and cosmetic acts, including certain requirements, applies to a biological product subject to regulation under this section, um, except that a product for which a license has been approved under subsection A shall not be required to have an approved application under section 505 of the food, drug, and cosmetic. So there, this statute about kind of how we're regulating biological products, it harkens back to, well, you don't have to have approval under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. I mean, that's actually the whole point of this statute, right? Is that this is a separate way to get approval. But you're saying that, that the final formulation is relevant to approval, but it's not relevant to classification. And that's why we don't care about final formulation or dosage form um, when you're trying to define biological product. But doesn't this statute here, subsection J, um, isn't it talking about approved applications? I mean, how, how am I to reconcile what, what you've been telling me? So that statute does say what your honor said, and it sort of points to the fact that even biologic products are subject to certain requirements under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Biologic products aren't, depending on the kind of product at issue, some of the requirements of the FDCA will also apply because the significant purpose and a primary purpose, one might even say of the biologic statutes, is to create this different approval pathway for products that are classified as biologics. But I think the key inquiry here is not what is the entire regulatory regime that applies to this kind of a product, but is this the kind of product that's subject to the different approval pathways for biologics? And so that question turns us on 262I1, which I, I admit, Your Honor, is not particularly availing. It just lists the kinds of products that are biologics. But FDA then defined one of, one of those categories and gave it content in the regulation. And that's the regulation that sort of focuses our analysis here. And that regulation doesn't say to look at the finished dosage form. Neither does the statute, Your Honor. The statute says, defines a biological product. Nowhere does it say, look at the finished dosage form. And there are practical reasons. My point is, is that this language in subsection J, 262J, talks about, you know, we are exempting products that has a license that's been approved um, um, under as a biological product, and then it says shall not uh, be required to have an approved application under Section 505 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And I guess what I'm trying to get at is to the extent that this is a fight about whether in this case turns on whether when we're looking at the active ingredient as far as the octopeptide versus the active ingredient in the viscous gel nanotubes. Um, if in order to get the application approved under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, they really evaluated the the gel, the extended release gel, because that's what you do when you get those applications approved. It's it's for if it's approved for a particular formulation. It, is that being incorporated here via this language in uh, subsection J, or section two sixty two? So, so I think the direct answer to your question, Your Honor, is no. Subsection J isn't speaking to classification. It's true that a product that gets approved, that for which there's an approved application under the biologic statute, doesn't require an approved application under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. But that that requirement doesn't then lead to the conclusion that all of the features outlined in the biologics application or in a new drug application 
are relevant for classification purposes. The question of whether something is a protein doesn't turn on whether it's what its dosage form is. A protein is a protein whether you look at it in a tablet form, gel form, capsule form. And it's important here to know this would be a harder question if Ipsen had in its briefs or in its product labeling or in its new drug application, frankly, it had ever said the nanotube is the active ingredient, but it didn't. At every stage, Ipsen said the active ingredient is just that octopeptide. So this isn't a case where you have to think about the nanotube as the relevant ingredient. The nanotube is, in, for purposes of this case, no different from other dosage forms, the tablet, the pill, the gel, the injection, a syringe. And so even though that that particular subsection of 262 cross-references the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, that doesn't tell us how to think about the question for classification purposes. For classification purposes, we look at the active ingredient because that's the only logical thing to look at. To, to, to conclude otherwise would be to say Congress intended in writing 262I1 in defining the different categories of things that are biologics, intended FDA for FDA to look at the formulation property or dosage form, which FDA has never done. All of the products that were transitioned pursuant to the transition statute uh, from as proteins to biologics regulation, FDA looked only at the active ingredient. And that's why Ipsen conceded from the very start of its brief on pages 11, 20, and 30 of its brief. In its reply, it quotes FDA's brief and says, look, proper unit of analysis is the active ingredient. And so it would- you didn't, you didn't um, finish the sentence in their brief. They said active ingredient in its final formulation. That's what they said in their brief. That's the gist of their- you Cut off. You cut off the rest of the sentence. And that's the whole thing that we've been debating about here for the last hour. In certain sections, they've said that that's true, that they should look at the active ingredient in the finished dosage form. And FDA says the active ingredient in the finished dosage form is still the lanreotide acetate. No one has ever said the active ingredient is an octopeptide, you know, somewhere outside the body, and then the nanotubes inside the body. Even inside the body, the active ingredient is still the octopeptide. And we know that because Ipsen explains in its drug approval application and its labeling that the unit that binds to the receptors that has the specific pharmacological effect of treating the indications for which this product is approved, it's carcinoid syndrome, it's acromegaly, is that octopeptide. And so the nanotubes but from that, you can infer, and you don't have to infer that it's very clear from everybody's papers, are controlling the frequency of dosing. They're part of the dosage form part of the analysis. And I think Your Honor trained in very early on 314.3b as a helpful regulation for defining these different components of the product. And it, it's clear if you look at those different definitions in that regulation, how to look at these different parts of the product or these different stages, however you might characterize them. Just so that I'm clear. When you use the term classification, you're using it to mean whether it's classified kind of at the high level as a drug product versus as a biologic product. Is that how you're using it? That's right, Your Honor. Whether it's regulated for approval purposes as a biologic or drug, as Your Honor described earlier. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. We urge this court to affirm. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Brian Burgess for Imogen Pharmaceuticals. I'd like to address, uh, Your Honor, Judge Wilkins' questions regarding the regulation for uh, what is an active ingredient that I'd like to touch briefly on analogous product or maybe say a word to conclude about uh, remedy should the court find a need to reach it. So on the, the regulation for uh, an active ingredient, you asked about or other direct effect, whether that could encompass the dosage form, the, the, whether something is a, an extended release. And as uh, government counsel indicated, the regulation specifically distinguishes uh, you know, the active ingredient, the drug substance, from the drug product, from the dosage form. So it's, it's well-established FDA practice that the properties of a dosage form, determining whether it's an immediate release or an extended release, those are pharmacokinetic properties, but they're distinct from what's actually having the pharmacological effect. That's not what is is determining what the active ingredient is. And I think it would work a pretty dramatic revolution in FDA practice if that kind of dosage form, that dosage property were considered to be part of the active ingredient. 
one thing that I think is worth noting, part of this statute, the trans- Or just what yes. would be a direct effect that's not a pharmacological effect? What would be an other direct effect? I, I think, I, I don't know the full scope of what the agency has determined that to be. I do, I do know that it has excluded pharmacokinetic effects that just determine the, the release rate of, of the product and how it operates. And so whatever it is, it's not the It's not form. this. It's not this. I, yeah, I, that would, I'm sure the FDA in, has, uh, has used that term in, in other places and as kind of a catch-all, but it has clearly excluded these kind of release properties and how, what the rate of release of a, a drug product is. You know, one, one thing the statute did, the transition statute, the BPCIA, was about creating a new abbreviated pathway for biosimilars uh, as, as compared to because it had found that the these more complicated protein, other products, it, the, the ordinary generic show the same active ingredient pathway wasn't working, so they developed a new pathway. It would be a really odd result if as a result of the statute and the agency's implementation of it, you would have some products that have the same active ingredient being uh, subject to the biosimilar pathway versus the ANDA pathway just based on concentration or other formulation properties. That would be a really odd result. I mean, these are the same, it's the same active ingredient either way. And yet, if you're having formulation properties make the difference, you have a totally different review standard that the agency applies. You have different reviewers engaged in this yeah, process. But, but in my past life, I used to litigate and the cases. Mm -hmm. And you would have people who would get patents for a different formulation of an active drug, you know, something that could be ingested in a capsule instead of um, ingested intravenously. Mm -hmm. um, and the FDA, you'd have to get a different new drug application for that different formulation, the capsule formulation, than the, um, you know, liquid right. um, ingestible formulation. So, I mean, doesn't it happen all the time that the FDA, even if they're, I understand it's all the same classification as a drug product, but that they look at different formulations and it has to go through a whole separate application process um, depending on the formulation? You would need to get a new approval. You can sometimes do it by a supplement. You can rely on the previous approval. And of course, what, the whole point of Ibsen's suit here is because they don't want us to be able to rely on the prior approval of their pro this active ingredient as being safe and effective. They argue we need to go through a whole other regime and, and meet the different standards. That's like what the suit is about, why yeah, they are trying. They want you to have to do all of that because that'll take you years. Right, and, and they didn't. Give them years of exclusive. And, right, and they didn't do it, by the way. They were, of course, approved under the drug approval regime, and then now they're trying to transition by taking advantage of the transition statute to block a safe and effective product. But yes, your honor's right. I mean, certainly you have to get new approval for a different dosage form, but you would, it's based on the same active ingredient. There's often an abbreviated process. You could use a 505B2 process, or if it's your own application supplement, which has abbreviated review because you're relying on the agency's previous determination that the active ingredient is safe and effective for its intended use. And there are the Sandoz case that Judge Rao issued the decision on about a year ago focused on the fact that the active ingredient, for example, is what you determine whether you get new chemical entity exclusivity. So it's, it's, it's baked into the, the approval process that it's focused on the active ingredient. Yes, you get the overall drug product approved, but uh, Ibsen has not disputed that what we are ultimately looking to is the active ingredient in this product. The active ingredient in this product is something they described on their label repeatedly as being the octopeptide, and because eight is less than 40, that is, I really think that ought to decide this case. And it's, I, I do want to push back on the suggestion that it's a new inquiry because we're dealing with the, uh, the biological product pathway and, and the purple book versus drug approval. Ibsen is relying on regulations and cases from the drug approval context. They're saying, they said it's the same. You look at the question of whether it is an active ingredient. And it would be kind of, it'd be quite odd, I think, if it was a different inquiry, because after all, we're trying to determine whether it goes in the drug process or whether it goes in the biological product process. And if the answer you get differs depending on where you start, that, that just couldn't work. So we, we are looking generally for what is the active ingredient. 
The agency has applied that consistently. The regulation clearly distinguishes between uh, dosage forms, formulation properties, versus what is actually having the pharmacological effect. Your Honor also asked about the second sentence in the regulation involving uh, a chemical change. What we think that that addresses is a situation that courts, FDA and the courts have dealt with uh, cases involving prodrugs, where you have something that actually does metabolize into something different in the body. That's the Act of Elizabeth case from this court in, in 2010. And Ibsen relied on that below and has not relied upon it here because uh, um, Judge Friedrich, this is at uh, Joint Appendix page 169, footnote 13, explained why that decision is not relevant here because you, well, the lanuretide acetate is in the, the drug product all along. There's not a conversion where it changes into something different. And so that aspect of the regulation, we just don't think is relevant. On, on the analogous product, unless uh, the court has any other questions about the protein issue, we agree with the government that ultimately all the court needs to decide here is, yes, analogous doesn't, isn't going to mean the same thing. We think that's common ground, but it needs to share critical characteristics that I think is also ought to be common ground as to what it means to be analogous. And FDA has identified size as being a critical characteristic to determine whether something functioning is being like a protein. They've, they've identified a bright line in, in the 40 amino acids. And as Judge Friedrich indicated, this, is, this one's not even close because this, isn't, uh, this is only an eight peptide chain that is far below what could ever be considered uh, a protein or like a protein. The, uh, there's a reference, um, I believe at 271 of the joint appendix where the agency indicates, you know, there's often gray area Let's in terms- But don't we have somewhat of a chinnery problem if we conclude that to the extent that the FDA, when it ruled in this case, that something can't be analogous to a protein if it has less than 40 amino acids. Um, it just can't be. Mm -hmm. It's just categorically can't be analogous. You seem to be saying, well, okay, I'm not defending that. But size is a relevant characteristic, and, and so eight isn't even close to 40, so we can um, say that, uh, that that's uh, a, a reasonable interpretation of the regulation. If it were 39, you know, Ibsen might have a, a, a case, but it's only eight, but all of that may be true, but that's not the way that the agency performed its analysis. So isn't that a chinnery problem? So to be clear, I think the agency applied the 40 line and that line was reasonable and that provides a sufficient basis to affirm. I was noting that as Judge Friedrich did, that this case was not close, but the, ultimately whether you're determining it as a protein or analogous, if the agency is allowed to decide that size matters because that is relevant to determining complexity, it, there's going to be a line drawing problem. It, it is sensible that the agency would draw the same line for protein and an analogous when it's dealing with the size feature. I agree analogous needs to sweep more broadly than protein as a category, and we think the mixture example shows that it does. But when dealing with size in particular, it'd be very odd if the agency were required to say 40 is a protein and 30 is analogous to a protein. I mean, it's really the same inquiry that size is a fundamental characteristic of whether something's a protein or analogous to it. And so well, what, what, are, what are characteristics that make something analogous other than the kind of three characteristics that defines whether something is a protein? So we agree with the government's characterization. The agency has provided clear rules of, of exclusion. It, it can't be out analogous to a protein if it lacks these fundamental fundamental characteristics, one of which is size. It, it seems to have treated the analogous product category as a small residual category that is going to be able to sweep in things that are not clearly contemplated in or out of the rule. And we think the mixture example certainly fits that. And the argument that a mixture that contains a protein is actually just a protein, we don't think that can be right. Because as everyone here agrees, if you're looking at the active ingredient, Okay, well, the way the FDA interprets active ingredient in a mixture context that looks at the overall product. So it makes more, no more sense to say, well, it's really a protein when you have a mixture of a protein and a, and a lipid and to say, actually, it's, all, it's really a lipid. 
And so it doesn't fit cleanly into the category. The agency has said in, in the memorandum, and this is addressed in the Teva decision, there's some discussion of the memorandum actually outlining the, the mixture example. If you have a, a mixture that is primarily composed of protein components, that's a protein. The agency acknowledges that. But what the analogous product mixture is designed to encompass is you have a situation where the protein is contributing to the therapeutic effect. It's necessary for it, but it might only be a small part of it. There are other necessary components. It could be that there's a much greater concentration of lipids in this mixture than protein. So it wouldn't make sense to say because it contains as one component out of others, it's a protein. The agency has concluded it's analogous to one. Mr. Burgess, if we concluded that this, this mixture category was a null set, would that be a problem for the agency's interpretation? Concluded it was a null set. And right, that there was like, there was nothing in fact that was analogous to a protein that wasn't a that, protein standing out. That, well, I mean, I, the district court suggested the null set would be. Wouldn't fun. be a problem. Well, right, as, as my colleague from the government indicated, it's clearly not a null set. The agency has identified products that fit within this category and has transitioned them as a result. In terms of whether it would be as a statutory interpretation matter, it would be a problem. I think everyone agrees that analogous product modifies as a grammatical matter all the enumerated categories on the list, including protein. So it needs to be analytically possible that there would be an analogous product, but whether it's an empirical matter, there would be something that fits into that category or how many there would be. We don't think the statute speaks to that. And that's how I understood Judge Friedrich's point on, on that category. That the fact, if you don't identify a, a substantial number or even any examples, that doesn't mean that this is a superfluous term. Is, is this a fair summary of your position which is when you look at the definition, any essential element of the definition will be a critical characteristic for purposes of this analogous assessment. And therefore, what's, what's swept in by analogous is just um, things as to which the definition is silent or ambiguous? I think that's essentially right. I mean, the definition doesn't, it doesn't have that many criteria. It's not a list of a dozen things that it needs to satisfy. It needs to be an alpha amino acid. It needs to be a chain of at least 40 uh, amino acids. And it needs to be a definite, defined, you know, mm -hmm. specific defined sequence. It needs to be those three things. We think that Ibsen's argument that the Teva case supports them is clearly incorrect. It was just one of the, the two or one of the three criteria that were at issue there. But yes, I think that's essentially right. Which solves your surplusage problem. It's just an odd, very odd way of saying construe the term protein to include cases of ambiguity. Well, the analogous product category, it does modify each of these terms. It's been in the statute since 1902. Uh, and, and Ibsen, I think this is at page 400 of the joint appendix. It's acknowledged that there's not going to be a clear way to apply analogous uh, across each enumerated category. It's going to be something that depends case by case. It's a scientific judgment. So this is how and, the FDA is And recently. maybe there's a square peg round hole problem when Congress just sticks protein into the list long after analogous was already there. Well, we think that it creates a situation where the agency has to reasonably interpret how to apply it. It, it understands analogous is going to share certain fundamental, fundamental characteristics, but not be coterminous with how it hashes that out is something that it can do on a case-by-case -case basis and that it has done reasonably here. Uh, if the court has no other questions on the merits, I did just want to note that we had a, an objection on remedy to Ibsen's argument that even if, it, if, for example, a court were to conclude that the agency hadn't adequately explained what, what an analogous product is, that by no way ju would justify an order removing our client's product from the market. The status quo is that Ibsen's product is regulated as a drug. If, if there is a uh, court order finding FDA's reasoning inadequate, okay, then that, that, that decision would be vacated and the agency would have to determine, uh, based on the court's reasoning, what the right analysis is. But it wouldn't automatically convert Ibsen's product to being a biologic. It wouldn't preclude the FDA's determination that Invigen's product is safe and effective and should be able to stay on the market. And it would be quite disruptive to order the, the removal of a an oncology product that people have been using for a number of years. It's an extended release product from the market. So we don't think that issue is actually presented here, both because the court should affirm and because the district court didn't reach remedy and we didn't take Ipsen in its reply brief to dispute the notion that if there is a question about remedy, that should be addressed on remand. But we did want to make sure the court was aware of that issue. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, Ms. Stetson, you are out of time, but we'll give you three minutes. Thank you, Your Honors. Just a, a couple quick points. The first is that the product that was submitted to FDA, that was reviewed, that was approved, and that Invigen used as its reference product is a product with lanreotide acetate in complex nanotube structures. Uh, now that, of course, we're talking about a transition from a drug product to a biological product, all of a sudden the lanreotide acetate in those complex nanotube structures doesn't matter. What matters is the eight uh, chain octopeptide. That is not consistent with the way that FDA, as Judge Wilkins, you asked uh, counsel for the government, that is not consistent with the way that FDA reviews, approves uh, drug products or biological products, and it's not consistent with the way in which those products are used as reference products. The second is FDA counsel, in response to your question, Judge Katsas, said FDA does not understand analogous to be close to a protein, but not quite. Uh, that, that, I think, is the exact problem. What FDA's counsel then went on to say is, if something that contains a protein that where the protein is necessary for functioning of the, <clears throat> of the product and specifically contributes to the functioning of the product, that can be a protein that's in a mixture. But as we say at page 18 of our reply brief, uh, what FDA has said before, and this is the Amarin case that we cite there, a mixture containing uh, a mixture is treated as a single active ingredient. So a mixture containing a protein is a protein. Um, the third thing I want to say has to do with the Teva case, because I, I take a little bit of issue with the idea that we're not accurately reciting what was said there. What FDA said in Teva, and you can find this at uh, pin site 113, is that the critical component of a protein is the specific defined sequence. Uh, FDA's uh, description was seconded by the district court at page 115 as the touchstone of a protein being specific defined sequence. And here's what the district court said. Under FDA's construction, I'm quoting, uh, it's simply restricted to products that although they may not satisfy the criteria to be a protein in other respects, have the characteristics specific defined sequence of amino acids. The specific defined sequence, of course, clearly exists here. Now that it does, FDA's critical touchstone component becomes something different. This structure in the final product of lanreotide acetate is a protein. Lanreotide acetate in somatoline depot should be treated as a biological product. And the remedy should be, of course, that it should be transferred over to the biological product category. Do you think the statutory structure, which distinguishes protein from proteins from things analogous to proteins, um, forecloses FDA from using a bright line regulatory definition as opposed to a fact and circumstances and maybe it's 40, but not quite. So we'll give you 38 and everything just devolves into case by case assessments. I think for purposes of defining protein, FDA could and did permissibly decide that it was going to try to create some bright line rules. Mm -hmm. I do think, to your point, Judge Katsas, earlier, the, the idea that something has to be analogous to a protein, and it can't be a null set, uh, does muddy the waters a little bit. Then the question is, what's the baseline that's required? FDA has already said what the baseline is. It has to be at least the critical thing is a specific defined sequence of amino acids. And here what we would suggest is when you're looking at this product, the product that was reviewed, submitted, approved, and referenced, and you have a specific defined sequence of amino acids that is a complex uh, structure of many, many peptides put together, that thing is a protein. That's analogous to the protein at the very least. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Your Honor.
Case number 23-7044, United States of America, ex-rail Mark J. O'Connor and Sarah F. Whitman, and Mark J. O'Connor and Sarah F. Whitman, balance, versus USCC Wireless Investment, Inc., et al. Mr. Woofter for the balance, Mr. Gulamillo for the appellates. Good morning, Ms. Woofter. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, I'm Daniel Woofter, appearing on behalf of the appellant relators, Mark O'Connor and Sarah Liebman. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, please. The district court dismissed this case under the public disclosure bar based on a 2008 complaint that was unsealed in 2009. Because the allegations in this case are not substantially the same as those in the 2008 complaint, that was wrong. Relators allege they independently uncovered, long after that complaint was unsealed and voluntarily dismissed, that King Street secretly agreed to transfer a disqualifying amount of its spectrum to USCC in 2011, and then it hid that 2011 agreement from the FCC so that it would not compromise its hundred, uh, over $100 million in discounts it received to purchase the licenses. Even those frauds that the prior complaint did disclose uh, were voluntarily communicated to the government by Relator Mark O'Connor before that complaint was unsealed. This case is thus the opposite of a parasitic lawsuit that should be dismissed under the public disclosure bar. The later's 2015 comm search study showed not only that the spectrum was in use by one single network across USCC and King Street licenses, but it also showed that the network signal was coming from cell towers that were owned or leased by USCC, not King Street. This was a per se violation of the FCC's attributable material relationship or AMR rule Governing transactions, a designated entity must report during its post-licensing unjust enrichment period. At the same time, relators were voluntarily communicating with the government about that, which prompted a second DOJ investigation. Relators uncovered that USCC, in a separate license auction, described a fictitious agreement that it claimed to have with King Street in 2012, where only a tiny portion of the King Street spectrum USCC already controlled under the hidden 2011 agreement. Even then, King Street itself did not submit or even describe either the real or the fake agreement in its submissions to the FCC, which it was independently required to do in its annual reporting during the unjust enrichment period. That isn't all. Relators also conducted market research and interviews and obtained customer contracts from USCC stores in three King Street markets which led them to discover that USCC was offering wireless services to the consumers in the King Street markets under USCC's name, not King Street. The local construction permits that were filed to meet USC, uh, King Street's build-out obligations were filed by USCC. An antenna in the King Street licensed areas were owned and registered under USCC alone. These discoveries should... Mr. Mr. This, this information, I mean, there was a lot of information in the FCC and SEC filings in this case that suggested, um, I guess, the X and the Y that would lead to an inference of fraud. And so, so why, while the relators here have uncovered other facts sort of surrounding those allegations, I mean, why, how do they substantially add to what was already in the public record? Um, are you referring to the FCC and SCC documents that were submitted in 2014? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was addressing the 2008 complaint, but as regard, regarding those uh, regarding those documents, which the district court did not rely on in this case, and I think it's quite an, you know important to note the defendants are relying on those documents and not seriously defending the district court's reasoning. Um, they do not disclose that anything about how uh, King Street. Uh, transferred a disqualifying amount of its spectrum in 2011. Uh, and, and if they did, King Street would have had to repay its licenses. And, and, and I think that the, the comm search study I was just describing is really indicative of that. You know, the, and in fact, when the DOJ was doing its investigation, and remarkable here, we're talking about a lot of facts that are outside of the complaint. And I think that's also something to note. You know, this is an affirmative defense. Defendants do not dispute that. So as I'm speaking, I may be referring to facts that aren't in the complaint but that we could absolutely allege on remand if this court thinks it's necessary to establish uh, that this is not a public disclosure. But so when we give that information to the government, the government conducted the second investigation. We then also gave information to the government about how we found this 2012 agreement that USCC submitted in a separate auction that only described a non-disqualifying amount of spectrum transfer. Uh, 
And when the government went back to USCC and said, you know, the relators in this case have said that everything you're describing about the 2012 agreement doesn't comport with what's actually happening on the ground, only then did they finally turn over the 2011 agreement to the government. They had never previously done that, and the government gave that to us. And that's what we used to make the allegations about the secret 2011 transfer in the current complaint. Now, the district court looked at the, just accepted the defendant's description that they're basically the same. It said, because the 2012 agreement showed that uh, during the unjust enrichment period, this spectrum would be used to a very non-disqualifying degree by USCC, that's no different than the fake or the, the real agreement that happened a year earlier that showed a disqualifying amount of spectrum under the rule. But that can't be the case, or else the FCC would not have granted the licenses and would not have approved that they retained the $100 million in bid credits. Um, also important to note, uh, in 2018, the uh, King Street and USCC asked the FCC for approval to sell those licenses. As far as uh, to USCC formally, that application remains pending. Uh, we're unaware of any uh, application like that that's gone and challenged that the FCC has held uh, without deciding for this long. Um, I think that, uh, you know, to the extent the court wants to think about anything outside of the complaint, there's actually quite a bit here that shows that what our relators discovered in their independent discoveries is material to the government and was not disclosed in any of these public filings in the FCC or SEC. And in fact, uh, back to the 2008 complaint, those fraudulent transactions that were alleged in 2008 aren't substantially the same as the pre-licensing auction frauds that the 2008 complaint alleged because the unjust enrichment fraud pleaded now could not have even plausibly been alleged in the 2008 complaint because the transactions that violated the AMR rule and the Macy rules had not yet occurred. And they couldn't because the FCC had not approved King Street as a designated entity entitled to bid credits. So it hadn't entered an unjust enrichment period where it would violate Does those the rules. the 2008 complaint, though, say that the alleged fraud was obtaining the licenses and continuing to use those licenses with the discount? No, the 2008 complaint says it was obtaining the licenses and then retaining them by parking them with the designated entities until such time as they could be formally transferred to so USCC. Isn't the, isn't the retaining it part of the... 2008 complaint? Even if this even if this court believed that as to King Street, what that does not say is that it wouldn't just retain them, but that it would actually then just formally or give them in a secret agreement in 2011 to USCC without telling the FCC about that. That's an entirely different violation of the rule than an agreement to retain them until the unjust enrichment period is over. They didn't wait till that time. They did it in 2011. It's a diff it's a different um, regulation in in the FCC scheme, the attributable relationship as opposed to the de facto control. So if, if that's how we look at it, you have a pretty strong argument. But why shouldn't we think of this? I mean, this whole thing we're talking about is the allegation is that a, a very big company conspired to set up these sham front companies to obtain licenses fraud with the bid credit fraudulently. And I mean, if, if that's what's going on, I mean, it's just baked into that, that they're obtaining the licenses in order to use them. I don't think what you're specifying is sort of um, just the completion of that scheme. I don't when think the company, sorry, I get no, 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 no just worries. You're when on. the company, when the big company actually um, uh, uses those licenses for its own benefit. Perhaps that might be true as to USCC, Your Honor. It would not be true of these individual designated entities, which are also defendants, as we'll talk about in a little bit in the advantage case. You know, if that is true here, that would bar the advantage complaint. An advantage did not even exist for 10 years until after this auction. And there was no relationship with this other scheming defendant, William Vale. So, uh, so, sorry, let's just stick with King Street sure. for now. I, I didn't and, get the distinction between and the, answering my question. Of course. You said, well, maybe 
maybe that's right as to U.S. Cellular, but not as to King Street or who was the one Ms. And that, Yes, and even and and as to um, this case, mm -hmm. um, and that was just the first part of my answer. The other part of my answer is, look, if you look at the text of the amended public disclosure bar, it says substantially the same transactions. It is not substantially the same transaction, fraudulent transaction, to say that the transfer that occurred in 2011 after that prior complaint was dismissed uh, is substantially the same as any of the transactions alleged in the 2008 complaint, um, because it's, an it's just a transaction that had not occurred if we had pled in 2008. I think a better way to think about this is if our relators had pled in 2008 that we anticipate that in 2011 during the, or let's just say during the unjust enrichment period, the, the King Street will not only retain the bid credits until after the unjust enrichment period, it will actually secretly transfer those uh, licenses to USCC during the unjust enrichment period. I think that would be an implausible allegation based on speculation. Right, that had to have occurred. Defendants, or I'm sorry, our clients had to discover it and share it with the government, and if, and it prompted a second investigation, which itself I think is very good and a good indication that it is not substantially the same allegation. There are a lot of um, cases under the 1986 statute. It says based upon the judicial gloss is substantially similar, and there are a lot of cases saying that. If something is continuing the fraud, implementing it, you're supplying additional details, none of that is good enough. I, so are, are you saying that that law is um, no longer good law under 2010, or are you saying that um, this is something more different? I, I, I don't think, to, to the extent this court had already said that it has to be substantially the same fraud or transactions mm -hmm. previously, I do think that that describes what the text of the statute says. And to say that this general allegation of fraud against USCC, untied to any perhaps, you know, sham entity or untied to any of these other defendants that were part of the scheme, uh, had there was like this general modus operandi that uh, USCC was following. That does violence to the text of the statute, which says substantially the same transactions. It just can't be that this general allegation of fraud covers substantially the same transactions, which didn't even occur until many years after that suit was just voluntarily dismissed. So it was your contention that that statutory language means that, um, let's suppose it was publicly disclosed, like every single possible detail of the fraud but um, up to, you know, year 2014 or something. And then um, you, your clients um, disclose to the government that the fraud continued in the same manner in 2015 that that would um, be outside the public disclosure bar because these are different transactions. I don't think that we're saying that if all the essential elements of this substantially same fraud had already been disclosed, continuing those things would be uh, fall outside of the statutory language. What I'm saying is that to the extent the prior disclosure disclosed that kind of fraud to to set up a sham entity to obtain bid credits. The fact that the FCC ultimately granted them and said, there's not enough here to think that King Street is a sham entity sort of diminishes that complaint even as the basis for these allegations of fraud that are, con that are, that are alleged now, which aren't continuing frauds. And, and another way to think about it is to say that King Street the FCC determined was not, in fact, a sham. It was a legitimate designated entity. We have that, and that's a reasonable inference you can draw on the complaint. And because of that, um, it's viable, but that doesn't mean that it could not then violate the other regulations from the FCC in its unjust enrichment period and cause an FCA violation by hiding it from the FCC, which is exactly what we allege occurred in 2011 and 2012. Um, and, and 
you know, it, to the extent this court even thinks that the 2008 complaint does substantially allege the same frauds again, uh, we have explained how Relator Mark O'Connor's own work that he voluntarily disclosed to the government prior to that unsealing makes him an original source of those allegations, and he'll always be an original source of the, he, those allegations. He, he didn't disclose to the government a different legal entity did, right? Firm. No, Your Honor. And again, this is why we should be granted leave to replete if necessary. You know, again, this is an affirmative defense. So uh, as this court sent into chapel, we don't have to plead around an affirmative defense in the complaint. This was dismissed after one motion to dismiss with prejudice, with no leave to replete, even though we asked for it. And if given the opportunity to replete, if this court does think it's important, we will be able to plead and then show to the other side how Mark O'Connor himself was sending communications to the government, voluntarily disclosing these allegations to the government in the lead up to the unsealing of that complaint when the government then asked the FCC to look at the allegations there uh, in the partially unsealed complaint uh, before making its uh, determination. Did, did you raise this argument in the district court that O'Connor, I mean, isn't this argument forfeited? It is not forfeited for a couple of reasons, Your Honor. Uh, first of all, we not only say it in the sentence, in the first sentence of the text, how this was Relator Mark O'Connor's work, we then explain in a footnote with case citation how uh, Relator's own work cannot make, um, cannot bar their own later complaint, right? So we, we definitely preserve the argument, and we certainly preserve the claim that he was an original source. So any refinement of the argument on appeal uh, is, uh, is not forfeited. That's from the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United. And yes, uh, EVS Candido, it's a long running proposition. But the other reason uh, is because, um, uh, you know, as we said, this is an affirmative defense. And we have argued from the outset that from the face of the complaint, it must be that uh, the, the plaintiffs have pleaded themselves out of being able to show that um, this isn't a public disclosure. The defendants then come and they say, well, the 2008 complaint under the firm O'Connor Lampert uh, is, you know, Mark O'Connor and Lampert is a public disclosure. And there's nothing in the face of the complaint that suggests that Mark O'Connor did not, as part of that lawsuit, communicate these allegations to the government. Sure, but he was doing it in his capacity as counsel for a different relator. Mark O'Connor was not counsel to the law firm in that case, Your Honor. So it's actually not even accurate to say he was doing it as counsel to the relator. And again, all of that is 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 supposition that is outside of the complaint or anything. Because I'm sorry, who is the relator in the 2008? Uh, Mark O'Connor's uh, prior titular law firm, his former right. firm, right? Right, but. But that's but the statute doesn't say you must be the relator to be an original source. The statute literally says no, but if you must to be an original source means you're just an individual who, prior to the public disclosure, has voluntarily disclosed to the government the indiv the the information on which allegations or transactions in the claim are based. Mark O'Connor is an individual who disclosed these allegations to the government. There could be multiple original sources, and there's a he reason. He is, but he's also a partner in the firm that is seeking the bounty that comes from being a relator. So if your theory is, well, he, but he's also kind of off on his own doing this work in an individual capacity. And well, I would seem to be a conflict of interest among other things uh, to set up his own relator complaint as opposed to that of his firm. You know, we're getting quite far afield from the allegations in the complaint, but I'll say I don't, I'm not sure that conflict of interest is necessarily the, you know, that there's any conflict of interest between a now defunct law firm whose own prior complaint has since been dismissed and that can't pursue these allegations. And the reason Congress used this broad language about uh, being an original source of the information is because the government, you know, the government contemplated that suppose that multiple individuals before the 2008 complaint had been unsealed had been communicating with the government about this, they would all be an original source. And, and there's good reason for that. And the reason is, if, as happened here, that complaint is dismissed or for some reason the relator decides not to pursue it, someone else who can claim original source status can pick up the torch and continue with the case. That's exactly what Mark O'Connor did here. And there's no reason to add this 
a, you know, a textual limitation to the language that Congress has modified three times in, in the history of this particular provision. It added it, it modified it in 1986, and because the, the sponsor of the AZ-6 amendments thought that the courts were being too strict about the language, they modified it again in 2011 to make it even, uh, to make the public disclosure bar even narrower and the original source status broader. Georgia, what is, um, what is the pleading burden on someone who's claiming to be an original source? I mean, what do they have to, to plead? Uh, they have to plead. I think that they have to plead that before the public disclosure, they had voluntarily disclosed to the government the information on which allegations or transactions in the claim are based. And the reason that's that alone is sufficient in this case, because the, own, the, the, the public documents the defendants rely on are on their face. I mean, literally a law firm is in Mark O'Connor's own name. So it's not apparent on the face of the complaint or any of the documents that uh, the defendants rely on that he is not an original source. And because, as this court said in DeChapel and its other cases addressing affirmative defenses that we highlighted, defendants do not use the words affirmative defense one time in any of their briefing uh, to, to dismiss at the 12B6 stage. And that's where we are on an affirmative defense. It has to be apparent from the face of the complaint. The plaintiffs cannot establish that they can defeat the affirmative defense. This may be a factual dispute. The jury will want to resolve or the court will want to dissolve at a later stage after discovery, but certainly not at this stage, the pleading stage, have the plaintiffs pleaded themselves out of showing their or an original source of the claims against King Street and the related defendants. You think it's clear that the 2010 amendment makes this into a merits issue rather than a jurisdictional issue? Uh, I, it's, the language is, it's a direction to the court. The court shall dismiss. And I know there are a lot of cases <laughs> in the last 15, 20 years saying don't overuse the J word, but a direction to the court um, is something that might feel jurisdictional. And so you could, one way of reading this amendment is it's still, it's still jurisdictional for most purposes, except the government can waive it by opposing. I am not aware of any legislative or statutory history case where Congress has taken the word jurisdictional out of the statute, and the court has said, nonetheless, it is still jurisdictional. That would seem to me to go quite against the mountain of authority you were uh, you know, alluding to earlier. Um, and, and the circuit courts, this court's uh, sister circuits, have unanimously held that this change made it an affirmative defense. And that, you know, I just... If this court were inclined to disagree with the other circuits, I don't think it should create a split in a case where the defendants have not made the argument. Mr. Walker, even if the public disclosure bar is an affirmative defense, isn't the original source an exception to the affirmative defense on which the relators would bear the burden? Um, that is also something no circuit court has held. But is and that how the circuits have sort of thought about it? They haven't just accepted that somebody was an original source kind of on the... I have, I, say so. I have reviewed the circuit cases that we cite in our brief that defendants do not acknowledge that address this, and I haven't found a single one that says that does it in that stepped in inquiry that your honor is suggesting. This would be the first course to definitively so hold. And for the same reasons I was just answering Judge Katz's uh, prior question, I don't think the court needs to even get there because the defendants simply do not address this argument at all in their briefing. We made it very clear under the standard of review in both of these appeals that this is now an affirmative defense, that this court's circuit, sister circuits have unanimously so concluded, and, um, and the defendants had nothing to say in response. Except that you have failed to adequately show at this stage of the case the voluntary disclosure to the government, which is a little hard to make sense of if this is a merits defense on 12b-6, makes perfect sense if it's still sort of jurisdictional in the sense I was um, asking about. So, uh, you know, and that also uh, is not an argument the defendants made. The, the defendants do not argue that the statute continues to be jurisdictional. Um, 
Uh, and, and, but to the extent no, but they say you have to show, they say we did not sufficiently plead that we voluntarily disclosed. We have the allegation that we voluntarily disclosed all of this to the government. They say that our, our private information. So they say that our allegations about having private information and alleging that we voluntarily disclose it to the government prior to the suit being unsealed, um, were insufficiently alleged. Um, we, we don't see how, like, how they were insufficiently alleged. We allege we have private information that we gave to the government. We know that the government actually investigated these allegations long before the complaint was unsealed. Um, and, and it's just hard to, uh, you know, to suggest that they have pleaded themselves out of so showing. And that is why we would be totally fine with an order from this court saying, you know what? Go back, add your allegations about how you voluntarily disclose this information to the government, um, and then and then establish that you're in fact original sources of the 2008 complaint. All right, we'll give you some time on rebuttal. Thank Let's you. Hear from counsel for USCC Wireless. Mr. Tulumelo. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. Drew Tulumelo on behalf of the appellees. District Court correctly dismissed the relator's second amended complaint under the public disclosure bar because it alleges the same fraud against the same 10 defendants in the same auctions involving the same licenses as the 2008 complaint. The what about this 2011 licensing agreement? I mean, that seems different. Because you, you could assume could assume all the de facto control in the world or not. If there's a later agreement that triggers a different theory of disqualification, which is you've transferred too much spectrum, it seems a little different to me. Yeah. Um, Your Honor, a few responses to that. First, they're incorrect that a network sharing arrangement is disqualified, okay? The FCC amended its rules in 2015 to prospectively prohibit the network sharing agreements. What had been prohibited prior to that time were- I'm sorry, but which reg is governed? You, you the, I assume we all agree that at the relevant time, if there were a lease, transferring more than 25% of any one license that would disqualify the designated entity. Yes, but the but the network sharing agreement was is, is not a lease. It was a agreement that would allow the use of King Street Spectrum on a fee for service basis categorized by the FCC later in 2015 as a network sharing agreement. But even putting that aside, stepping back, the entire thrust of the 2008 complaint was that U.S. Cellular had set up each of the three designated entities as shams and fronts that would bid on credits for, bid on spectrum licenses for the benefit of U.S. Cellular, and that U.S. Cellular would use that spectrum in its discretion. That's set forth in the complaint. They repeatedly allege in the 2008 complaint that U.S. Sailor exercises de facto control over all three designated entities. They, and that's paragraph 64, 68, and 72 of the 2008 complaint. It specifically alleges that the ownership, financing, and control of all three were identical in all material respects. And the complaint alleges that post-award fraud was already occurring. And that's at JA 665 and 666. And it also specifically alleged that U.S. Sailor was following the same strategy for King Street. That's at JA 653. So under any plausible definition of substantially the same, the complaint, the Second Amendment complaints allegations are substantially the same as the 2008. And to the extent there's a temporal difference, a later in time continuation of the fraud, there are many, many DC circuit cases that say later in time examples or continuations of the fraud aren't 
enough to evade or circumnavigate the substantially the same requirement. Aren't those cases construing substantially similar rather than substantially the same? They, they are, but we think whether it's substantially the same or substantially the similar. Here, I mean, here you could, you have. Aren't, aren't those two things, when Congress changes it, substantially the same? I'm sorry, from substantially similar to substantially the same? Doesn't that tell you that they um, want it to be kind of a more restrictive? Sure. I think whatever, whatever delta there is between substantially similar and substantially the same, we more than satisfy the same requirement because the auctions are the same. The 10 defense are the same. The fraud is the same. So there is no daylight between the allegations of the 2008 complaint and what you have before you uh, here. I did want to make sure I address a kind of recurring um, statement in both the argument and in the reply brief that, well, gee, you know, if we just had the opportunity to amend and plead this, that, you know, we, we, we could do that. I mean, it's very well settled that you must make a request to the district court to, for leave to amend. And it is also very well settled that a bare, bare bones request in an opposition to a motion to dismiss saying we would like to amend without any elaboration of what allegations would be added is not sufficient. I mean, the uh, rule says you're supposed to attach the proposed amended complaint, doesn't it? Exactly. Local, that's exactly right. Local Rule 7.1 and 15.1 both make that clear. In Kowal versus MCI Communications, um, 16F3, 1271, uh, in, in this court. And that is bread and butter everyday practice in the district courts of this circuit that you don't do drive-by, oh, we can amend, we won't tell you what we will amend. Well, I mean, what did they want the district court to evaluate or to do? They, they did nothing. There was two and a half years they had while this, in the face of our arguments that they, that the public disclosure bar applied and they did nothing to, they did nothing to signal to the district court that there, there could be amendments that might change the outcome. This goes, this goes to voluntary disclosure, right? This goes to this point, amend in order to spell out that the uh, Mr. O'Connor disclosed to the government before the 2008 complaint. Was yeah, well, it goes, it even goes backing up. It goes even to that he was an original source, which is not something right. even, you know, but the district if, court could. Why did they have to plead any of that if this is now a non jurisdictional? defense, you know, they can plead themselves out of court, but other than that, they don't have to anticipate the defense and rebut it in their pleading. Your Honor, generally, uh, let me take this in a, in a few different ways. They never argued below that this was an affirmative defense that would have required a sort of Do you agree it's now a merits issue rather than a jurisdictional issue as 2010? I, I think I think it, it likely is a merits issue, but it is but for purposes of what we're talking about, which is pleading burden, I think it is very different than sort of some traditional affirmative defenses that are listed in Rule 8, like latches, because it you is think even though it's a merits affirmative defense. The relator in the complaint has to plead out and satisfy Twombly and Iqbal and Rule 8 and maybe Rule 9 on the original source and voluntary disclosure issues? Subtle tweak on that. Okay. Okay. Which is that the, the statutory command to dismiss the case. Mm -hmm. That even assuming it's an affirmative defense, merits defense, right. not jurisdiction, nothing has changed under the traditional rules that the court can consider items uh, by a judicial notice, items that are integral to the complaint. There's nothing that bars a district court at Rule 12b-6 from considering those. 
Now, if properly viewing all of those materials, it is obvious that the affirmative defense applies, then yes, there is a pleading burden on the plaintiff to come forward to claim the benefit of the statutory exception under the public disclosure bar. And that is what two district courts in this circuit have held. This Judge Mehta in the Athena Construction Group case traced that through. And Judge Leon, following that case in United States, Lozano. And the Eighth Circuit has specifically reached this issue and has said, assuming it is perhaps even holding, if it's not, even if it's not jurisdictional post the 2010 amendment, courts still, and this is an amber secchia, can still dismiss if, at the 12B6 stage. If what? If the complaint pleads, the, pleads them out of court? No. Or, yeah. let me give you the, I just want to okay. make sure I have the trigger correct. Or judicially noticeable materials conclusively establish the defense with a high enough degree of certainty that we're comfortable doing it at an early stage. The, the latter, okay. the latter, okay? And, and, and that also tracks this court's precedence with Title VII exhaustion, which there had been a long debate about whether exhaustion was jurisdictional or was merits. In Zipes, the Supreme Court said, hey, it's not jurisdictional, it's merits. And then this court in three cases, including, I would add, a case Relator cite as the proper standard of review, okay? Bowden versus United States, along with Saltz versus Lehman and Williamson versus Shalala, they make clear that if defendant meets its burden, this is talking about um, affirmative defenses, defendant bears the burden of pleading and proving it. If the defendant meets its burden, the plaintiff then bears the burden of pleading and proving facts supporting equitable avoidance of the exhaustion defense. And then in both the Shalala case and the Saltz case, the court affirmed dismissals under 12b-6 on the ground that the defendant had come forward and shown through the judicially noticeable and other materials that exhaustion had not been, uh, the plaintiff had not exhausted and concluded that we believe the plaintiff has the burden of pleading and proving in the district court any equitable reasons for its failure to exhaust. Sorry, I don't, I don't see Shalala. Can you just give me your best case for the conceptual point from our court or the Supreme Court, and then Bowden. your best district court case or what best case applying this principle to this question? Bowden versus United States from the D.C. Circuit. Um, on the conceptual point. Yeah, on the conceptual point. And uh, I'd say Judge Mehta's case in Smith versus Athena Construction Group and Ambrosecchia. But Judge, Judge Katz, if I could go one step forward, I think, to make or further to make the analysis even easier. Let's okay. say that it is a full-blown deceptive kind of rule and we need to find something somewhere that absolutely negates and obliterates the, uh, the plaintiff on the face of the complaint. Well, at footnote one of the second amended complaint, they allege, they make clear that the pre-2010 act applies to the pre-2010 conduct. And Remember that this, no, we're in 2024 now, but auction 58 was in 2005. Auction 65 was, uh, 66 was in 2006. Auction 73 was in 2008. So when you look at their complaint, the five causes of action, a conspiracy, making false claims in those auctions, um, uh, using false records in those auctions, obtaining false government property when the licenses were awarded. So much of that conduct occurs before 2010 when they themselves plead that the prior version of the statute 
applies. And, and that is why, frankly, they took on the burden of trying to plead that they were original sources. It's why they, in my view, filed in the Western District of Oklahoma, which has like zero connection to this district to get as far away as possible from that earlier complaint because they were trying to sort of evade the preclusive impact of those earlier of the earlier public disclosure. So even going all the way, I think it is satisfied. All right. If you um, have anything else that you didn't cover and want to cover, I'll give you a minute. Okay. Uh, I don't. I, I just haven't committed to memory. I think it's Meacham is the Supreme Court case that holds that the party seeking the benefit of a statutory exception has the burden to plead it. That's the one. That's the last point I would close with. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Woofter, um, you were out of time, but we'll give you two minutes. I'll be very brief, Your Honor. I just want to make a couple of points. Um, the first point is uh, that when Judge Katz, as you asked my colleague on the other side about the 2011 agreement, his response is that our allegations about what that agreement shows are factually inaccurate. That is obviously not something that the court should be resolving at the 12B6 stage. Uh, two, a lot of the argument was centered on this and pleading I'm, burden. And on that, I mean, I'm not really comfortable trying to figure out whether or not there was or wasn't a lease within the meaning of the regs, but whether that was the same kind of thing alleged in the 2008 complaint, I think we can get our arms around. I think that's right. Um, and, 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 but that is, you know, not, it, not what my colleague's response was. Um, and two, uh, we absolutely argued to the district court multiple times that this is now an affirmative defense. Um, and the reason you don't, you know, you were asking about Shalala uh, and not seeing it in the pleadings or, or in the briefing is because, again, my colleagues on the other side nowhere addressed this. And they could have, and we never had a chance to respond with whether these Title VII or other retaliated statutory or regulatory regime pleading burden shifting things apply in this context. Um, and as to whether or not this is a full blown De Chepel sort of inquiry, um, you know, De Chepel very clearly says that uh, even after Twombly, you just don't need to plead around an affirmative defense. And we never got the chance. And, and the reason that we never even thought to make the kinds of rule, local rule seven, uh, you know, attachments or anything like we we had no uh, idea that the district court was going to ignore our argument that look, setting aside that it's contrary to logic, fact, and law that Mark O'Connor's own prior suit could disclose, uh, could bar his later suit as parasitic. You know, the, the district court said nothing about it, so we didn't know that we would have to say something about how. You know, apparently our, our allegation that this was voluntarily disclosed was insufficient. And the last point I wanted to make is um, that the, uh, my friend on the other side said nothing about the materially ads inquiry. We explained in our briefing about how, in all events, both of the relators here are original sources because the later allegations about the 2011 uh, transfer uh, not only could influence the government decision on this, it did. The government investigated and through that investigation, found this secret 2011 agreement and gave it to us. And that itself is sufficient to show that there are original sources under the second path to original source status. And my friend on the other side has not said anything about it in this oral argument. Thank you. Take the case under advisement. Case number 23-1741, United States of America 
Israel, Mark G. O'Connor, and Sarah F. Liebman, and Mark G. O'Connor and Sarah F. Liebman, at balance, versus U.S. Cellular Corporation, et al. Mr. Wuchter for the balance, Mr. Akawa for the FLEs. Uh, hello again, Your Honors. I'd like to reserve three minutes here as well, please. Uh, in this appeal, the district court held that disparate FCC and SEC documents that the defendants filed in several fora publicly disclosed substantially the same allegations of fraud alleged in our complaint, and that relators are not an original source of those allegations. That was also error. Uh, the complaint only plausibly alleges FCA frauds because these relators are the relators who have been investigating USCC and its affiliates in collaboration with the government for over 15 years. Uh, they are not plaintiffs who merely picked up an indictment and pasted allegations in a key TAM complaint uh, okay. with no independent knowledge or work. Uh, and without okay. relators' contributions, there would be no plausibly alleged fraud in this case. Uh, thus, like the related appeal, it is absurd to call this a parasitic lawsuit. Uh, defendants would like to uh, this court to believe that these six uh, FCC and SEC documents both misrepresented the true state of affairs and also belied the truth the X and the Y that in combination allow the observer to infer fraud, Z. But at the same time, defendants have extensively relied on these same documents to argue there was no misrepresented state of affairs. Uh, they can't have it both ways, and in so trying have argued themselves out of their own affirmative defense here too. Uh, every one of the FCC and SEC documents publicly touts that William Vale would, and did, exercise control of advantages bidding and after all decision making over advantages is build out and the wireless services offered to consumers in its licensed areas. None of the FCC or SCC filings would lead even the most intrepid first time reader to infer the frauds that relators allege against advantage, William Vale, USCC King Street, and the related defendants. That Vale did not, in fact, control the bidding, the build out, or the wireless services that would be provided, and that only USCC ultimately provided to consumers in the advantage licensed areas. And we know this because the intrepid first-time readers at the FCC granted the licenses to Advantage in 2016 because it did not have the benefit of Relators' other fraud allegations based on their independent knowledge, which first became public when Relators' complaint was unsealed in 2019, three years later. Thus, defendants never disclosed that Advantage never intended to control the bidding, hire any staff, maintain real offices, or make any decisions regarding uh, build out or wireless services, all discoveries that relators made and communicated to the DOJ before filing suit. The why is what our own private investigators found, that USDC and King Street controlled the bidding. And thereafter, Advantage had no network, no employees, no business of any kind for its uh, entire unjust enrichment period that would be expected of a wireless telecom company controlling over $450 million in spectrum licenses. And we can start with the bidding. Uh, defendants never informed the FCC that the bidding would be conducted from King Street's offices or that one of the two authorized bidders, Stephen Hines, was an employee of King Street with no contractual or other relationship with Advantage or William Vale, who was first asked to be a bidder by Allison DiNardo of King Street, not Vale. This is important because Hines had full FCC authority uh, to bid for Advantage and the power to control is de facto control under the FCC's regulations. Because Heinz's role in relationship with King Street wasn't disclosed to the FCC, relators only learned the full picture by interviewing Heinz after the DOJ declined to intervene. And this is just one part of the evidence uh, that relators gathered that, when considered together, establishes that advantage it hid from the FCC that had across the de facto control line. Uh, before it won licenses at a nearly $113 million discount. Critically, relators also allege that defendants had disqualifying arrangements that they purposefully hid from the government, and relators even provided an example of one, the 2011 lease that we described previously. Uh, especially given Heinz's undisclosed status as a King Street employee with full authority to control advantages bidding, King Street's own status as a designated entity would have been material to the FCC. In Dish, this court held that a bearer, general allegation of undisclosed agreements was sufficient at the pleading stage, a holding the government recently expressly did not dispute. In all events, even if this court were to accept the distorted view that publicly available documents contained all the essential elements that lead to an inference of fraud, the relators are an original source of the allegations. Even under this court's case... Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, one fact that I think was in the public domain was that Advantage anticipated having only one employee. I don't think that's actually what the disclosures said, Your Honor. It said that there would be one manager of Advantage with a salary of $50,000 a year. It did not say it would be limited to a single manager and that outside of the managerial positions, no other person would ever be employed by Advantage to help with its uh, operation as a 450, you know, a telecom company with $450 million worth of licenses. And, and, and th this goes to the distortions that the, that, that the defendants make as to all of the public disclosures. They contain empty, innocuous facts. They also say, we did disclose that these, this bidding was in King Street's offices, for example. But when you look at what they actually said to the FCC, it said that King Street would establish a place where there could be bidding. They did not say that that place would already be established in King Street's offices. And as we cited in our briefing, the FCC finds it, uh, you know, has denied the status where the bidding showed that the bidder would not have unfettered access to the um, to a non-designated entity's office space. The, and none of nothing in the FCC disclosures that the defendants have pointed to shows that that was what was disclosed to the FCC. Um, same thing goes for pretty much everything that we allege in terms of, you know, everything that they point to are the misrepresented or misleading state of affairs, again, the X. It's only what we were able to add with the Y that shows that these half-truths that they presented to the FCC so that they would not raise suspicion. You know, and, and again, I think the bidding one may be the, the biggest um, uh, failure to disclose that we have specifically alleged. Again, they did not tell the FCC that one of the two authorized bidders who had full authority to bid full control of advantages bidding was a King Street employee who was asked to do so by Allison DiNardo and who had no contractual relationship with uh, King Street or Allison DiNardo, or I'm sorry, with Advantage or William Vale. Um, I would just say that even under this court's cases interpreting the prior version of the FCA, FCA relators non-public information materially added to the FCC and SEC filing on which defendants in the district court relied. I think this court's case in Springfield Terminal is instructive. That case, this court held that the relator's very minor additional investigation was enough to make it an original source of publicly disclosed allegations of fraud going to the same defendant for the same uh, fraudulent transactions. Uh, in particular, the relator argued that an arbitrator falsely claimed payment for services never rendered to the government and that the relator largely, largely relied on pay vouchers and phone records submitted to the publicly disclosed filing. Uh, so his actual pay vouchers were disclosed, the X, but there is here the things that showed the vouchers to be false were not. Uh, and this is a stronger case. Uh, the pay vouchers, in, in, in addition to the fact that FCA has since been amended to make the public disclosure narrower and original source status broader, the pay vouchers in Springfield uh, Terminal were demonstrably false because they included, for example, claims for payment for arbitration services on days the government could easily have discovered, just like the relator there, that the defendant was at a three-day conference by calling several of the numbers listed on the arbitrator's publicly disclosed phone records. The X, the misrepresented state of affairs, was the publicly disclosed vouchers and the phone records as well, uh, and the Y, the true state of affairs, that the arbitrator was instead at a conference, was readily discoverable based on the publicly available documents, Yet the court held there, as it should hold here, that the relators connecting the dots by then actually calling the numbers materially added to the publicly disclosed false and fraudulent transactions. Let me just give you a, a couple of propositions that my notes say were in the public domain. And let me know if I'm wrong about this. So one is that it was, it was known, and assume there are no channels of communication okay. um, for this question. Sure. One is that the, the limited partner, which is King Street, would establish a bidding room and assist in the conduct of bidding activities at the auction. It's helpful to you. It's JA 783. Yes, that is what was publicly available. Okay, shall provide bidding services for the auction. Yes, that was also publicly available. Um, Vale 
would work with Denardo. That's at 145. That was also a public the advantage would bid on licenses that overlapped with cellular's coverage area. Also publicly available. Okay, so why doesn't that give a pretty good sense that um, advantage is really working with King Street and U.S. Cellular? Because working with is not disqualifying. A non-designated entity having actual control is disqualifying. And what those documents do not say to the FCC is that one of the bidders who had full control to bid for advantage was a King Street employee with no contractual uh, or other relationship with Advantage or Vail that would circumscribe or otherwise delineate what Stephen Hines was allowed to do in the bidding. It did not disclose that. All right. We'll uh, hear from counsel for... Less cellular, and we'll give you some time on rebuttal. Good morning, Mr. Akua. Akua, yes. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, my friend on the other side started in what struck me as a very strange place in representing that the fraud that they alleged couldn't possibly have been inferred. Um, based on the documents that were placed in the public domain during the FCC wireless auction proceeding. That's strange because that is exactly what the relators claimed from 2015 through the seal period until, uh, until the, 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 claim, the complaint was unsealed. And the district court judge Chuck and said, this, compl this complaint is barred by the public disclosure rule. Only at that point did they turn around and say, actually, we couldn't have inferred it from what was known. And I think that pivot is, is you know, reflective of what's going on here. You have a, you have a public proceeding. I mean, put aside the litigation history. I mean, I have to say, what, what's in the public domain seems pretty fishy. What they have disclosed at the end of their sleuthing seems quite shocking. And why, why can't that delta matter? Well, I think it's important to, to start, as these courts, as this court's cases say, from Springfield Terminal forward, with what was disclosed. And Your Honor ended with my, with my friend by identifying just a, a few of the um, items that were disclosed by, um, by Advantage with respect to its business organization and with respect to its very close interrelation with, with U.S. Cellular. So here's what was disclosed. They said that we're a brand new entity. We've just been formed. We had zero dollars in general revenue this year. We have zero dollars last year, zero dollars the year before. Not just us, our entire corporate chain. Um, Advantage was nonetheless bidding on hundreds of wireless spectrum licenses and markets from coast to coast. The connections between US Cellular and Advantage are laid out. If you're, the court looks at JA 453, there's one chart that shows the corporate relationship, the control line running through frequency advantage, through Sunshine to, to Mr. Vale on one side, and on the other side, the equity, 90% of the equity in U.S. Cellular. So the, it's, there's no dispute, and there's no secret to the FCC that okay, all this is together. That's fishy. But, I mean, you could imagine, you could imagine someone like Vale being, you know, having experience in the field wanting to legitimately stand up a new startup company and sure he's going to work with bigger players but you know he's competent enough to control his own part of the operation and they don't cross the control line and they don't lease they don't cross the 25% lease line but I mean, you you could imagine that, that, well, that's that's what we say existed. Mr. Vale, par paragraph 90 of their amended complaint describes Mr. Vale's ex okay, I mean, experience if in the industry. Say, if that's what you say existed, how, well, why is the inference of fraud so clear that they don't materially add anything when they show, you know, this guy's a retiree in Florida who's 
What, what must be there is information sufficient to put the government on the trail. That's the test in, in Staples, for example, um, and Oliver going all the way back. So could the, was, the, was the government on the trail? And the whole point of this regulatory proceeding is to put the FCC on the, on the trail. The FCC isn't, isn't blind to the concern that the small business subsidy structure it set, it set up could, could be abused. So it says, give us your, give us your information. And also, critically, we'll make it public. So they're part of the process is not only for the FCC to examine what is what is known, ask the questions that I asked. There were forty some interactions between Advantage and FCC and the FCC in this circumstance, but also allow the public to do so. And in some circumstances, members of the public have objected um, to, to application. So that's that's the nature of the proceeding is. Give us information about the structure. Give us information about the business. The FCC considers this very question of whether there's impermissible control. So I think that's the trail. Now, in terms of what's what's shocking, I, I think there's a, a, a misunderstanding um, that my friends have latched onto about what it is that the FCC expects of designated entities in the situation. There's a 2015 order cited in our brief. And it goes right to this question of, was the FCC expecting designated entities like Advantage, with no general revenue, to come on the market and start just delivering wireless services to customers? And here's no employees, we know, we know. no place of well, business. Well, with, with or without, with or, with or without Judge Kansas. So here's what, they, here's what the FCC says. This is 2015, so this is after the auction, it's before, it's while the FCC is considering uh, Advantage's application before the applications have been, before the licenses have been awarded. Even large scale wireless providers backed by well capitalized corporations have struggled to develop successful business models to compete in today's wireless marketplace. If major corporations cannot enter the market as new providers and deploy facilities based services to consumers, and this is the kicker, it is wholly unrealistic to expect small businesses to do so. And so what the FCC says is, well, we understand that if you start from scratch in this market, you're not gonna compete with AT&T, which is $100 billion plus of revenue each year. What we expect is that you'll take advantage of ownership of, of, the, of the license, possession of the license, the business opportunities that are presented, to work and connect and partner with others. That doesn't require a storefront. That doesn't require employees. It requires trying to figure out what the business opportunities um, are. It's also, you know, part of, part of, the, com part of the claim here is- It was makes perfect sense, but it seems hard to reconcile with outer boundaries that carve out de facto control or 25 percent not at all pieces. what the, the commission is clear what the the designated entity has to control its own business has to control the licenses but can and is expected to to work with others and again expected to work with u.s cellular within a context where u.s cellular is provided 100, 100 multi hundred million dollar loan um mr vale has the right well, one of the one of the uh, suggestions that's made is that it was couldn't have been anticipated that Mr. Vale would sell the license the license rights to U.S. Cellular. That's not right at all. That's on the face of the of the agreements that are made and that were disclosed to the FCC that Mr. Vale had a right to force U.S. Cellular to buy the licenses, and there are also qualified rights of U.S. Cellular to purchase the licenses from from Mr. Vale. So this whole notion that. They're going to they're going to bid together. There's a bidding protocol too, whereby there's a bidding council that King Street, Ms. Donardo herself is a part of, um, along with a, a representative of U.S. Cellular and Mr. Vale. They're going to talk together about what bids to make. The bidding protocol also makes clear. It says here's how we're going to value the licenses, and it's this is at JA 853. Um, here's how we're going to value the licenses. The greater the degree of overlap. With U.S. cellular wireless operating areas, the greater the amount that advantage will be. So all of this is disclosed. All of this is put on the record. The FCC examines it and says, "Good, good to go." That's the. So the question is: Was the government on the trail 
yes, the government was on the trail. The government was on the trail from the beginning. It designed the scheme to be on the trail. Well, let me ask you a conceptual question. I mean, if, if we were to find that the public disclosure bar applied here, which is the best channel for these FCC and SEC um, filings? Right? So, is, it, is it number one? Is it an administrative hearing in which the government is a party? Is it an other federal report or hearing? I, th I think it's, so I think the easiest one for us is channel two, that it's an other federal hearing. Um, my friends, another federal hearing, not report. An, an, other, an other federal hearing. We have a, we have an argument as well. That's an other federal report. For in Staples, for example, there's a there's a governmental website that's then the information provided by the government is put on a private website, and that's considered to be the news media. So that it would be strange, I think, to think that that report that when the government provides it itself, that's not qualifying. But I think other federal hearing is the easiest. Here you have. You have, you have a designated entity advantage, uh, advantage spectrum that comes to the FCC and says, here's our, our, our application. It's considered at length. There are a number of um, exchanges between the government um, and advantage. And then you have the public also weighing in. That, that seems to be clearly a And hearing. so ruling like that would mean that virtually any federal licensing proceeding would be a federal hearing. I, and the documents then would, you know, disclosed in that kind of licensing proceeding would fit under channel two. I, I, I think I think so, um, with the with the caveat that you know, of course it would have to be in order for it to matter, um, it would have to be publicly disclosed. So there are many kinds of licensing proceedings. You know, the court heard earlier an FDA related case. I don't think that every new drug application would fit, even if it's a hearing, and I think you could bracket that, because for the most part, the submissions are protected. They're they're um, they're protected commercial information. The FDA is generally prohibited, with exceptions, from disclosing those materials. So, so anything publicly disclosed, public, no, publicly licensing. disclosed in a licensing proceeding, and, and with a um, in a in a licensing proceeding where you have this kind of um, governmental focus on the matter, and then uh, and it, as well as public um, public rights to view um, to view and analyze the materials. And again, that's what the relators did. Right, 2015. I said, "Well, look at this information that's here. It's been disclosed, and we have a fraud claim that's based on it. And in other in other settings, such as the Vermont wireless cases that this court is familiar with, parties objected um, to the grant of licenses based on what was available. So I do think other federal hearing is the easiest. The government or the district court relied on Channel One, um, the where the government is." A party to the hearing, we think that's plausible too. One of the issues that ha that underlies this is that below, relators didn't raise any issue as to whether the government was a party. Their sole argument was that it was not a hearing because there wasn't anything live. It is an interesting. I mean, the FCC is a kind of adjudicator in a licensing proceeding, but the FCC is also the owner of the spectrum. Exactly. Or exactly. The licensing of the spectrum, and so I, I think it's a con interesting conceptual. Yeah, I, I, I think you, I think that could be that could be right. We think two is easier, but one with it is the government a party? Where it is the it's the proprietor? It's the sovereign who owns the commons. It's saying how will the commons be used? You can think about environmental permitting and drilling contexts as well. And then the government is the recipient of the revenue from the from the proceeding. I think it certainly could be. The government is a party in this kind of context as, as well. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Woofter, I think you were out of time, but we'll give you two minutes. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, I'd like to start with this idea of what it is that materially adds to set the government on the trail. And the question is on the trail of what? The FCC, in an unchallenged adjudication like, or unchallenged uh, proceeding like this, is not a fraud investigator, and they are not adjudicating something among multiple parties as they did in the FCC case that against DISH's designated entities or sham designated entities. And I actually think that that case is very important because my friend on the other side has not explained why it is that the FCC would deny the licenses in that proceeding to those entities based on the publicly disclosed filings that they suggest um, showed uh, that there was a disqualifying relationship 
but grant the licenses here based on the FCC filings when there were not these other allegations that we bring based on our own information. I think as Judge Katz, as you were asking, there should be little question that our allegations materially added to the allegations that were in the public domain on that basis alone. I'm sorry, Judge Rahe, I can go. Okay. Um, uh, also this idea of whether, you know, these, this public disclosure channel argument is, it is interesting conceptually, uh, but this, but because, you know, that we are original sources and these are not substantially the same transactions as alleged in the FCC, SEC filings, we don't think this court should wade into any of that at this stage now that the briefing is complete and it's become clear what the real issues are. Um, you know, those are issues of first impression for this court that are, you know, forefront issues nationwide that few courts have addressed, and there's no reason to do it now. Um, so, sorry, you want a ruling on materially add? I, we want a ruling that these are not substantially the same allegations as what was disclosed in the FCC and SEC filings. Right. And, but if we lose on that, we want a ruling that, at the very least, we absolutely materially added. And that is why the government investigated these Substantially the same analysis would assume a way the channels of communication problem? Absolutely. Because if, because if it is... Assume all the channels. Yeah. Are, even assuming that these fall within the three Romanets, one, two, and three, they have to be public disclosures of substantially the same transactions. And if they were public disclosures of substantially the same transactions that showed de facto control, the FCC would have denied the licenses here as it denied them in DISH. At the very least, at the pleading stage, we've established we that. We can take anything from the FCC's decision to license or not license as to whether the FCA has been satisfied here. I'm, I'm just not sure that the FCC's actions really speak to any of that, because they could decide for any number of reasons to move ahead with a license. Then I suppose that the better you know, way to view it is what did the DOJ do when we uncovered that King Street had, in fact, given its spectrum to USCC, and that a King Street employee had full control over Advantage's bidding. The DOJ investigated those allegations. So the idea that it could set the government on the trail of fraud, it did, and they actually pursued it in this case. Um, and, if, and my very, very final point is that, you know, the, the we made it in the briefs, and I'll just highlight it here. The other way this court can avoid all of these questions is because the defendants themselves argue that the 2008 complaint is the relevant public disclosure that disclosed these frauds. And because, as we explained in the other case, uh, Mark O'Connor is an original source of the allegations in the 2008 complaint, which under the uh, post-2010 FCA, he voluntarily disclosed to the government in 2015, uh, he is an original source of the allegations here as well. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Let's take the case under advisement. Thank you.